multilingual university contexts. She is also the co-editor of a book called Plurilingual Pedagogies, Critical and Creative Undertakings for Equitable Language and Education, released in 2020. I'm personally grateful and deeply appreciative of the research work that Saskia has been engaged in, as it brings a uniquely Canadian perspective to the field that is so often missing. Welcome Saskia, and thank you for taking this opportunity to share your knowledge with us today. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's wonderful to see you and to see some other familiar faces. I really appreciate the invitation and I'm looking forward to the dialogue that we're going to have. I'll start by um, sharing my screen, if I may. All right. So um, I'd like to begin, well, I'll, I'll share first the title of my talk, Advocating for Multilingualism in Assessment in or for Ontario Education. That's what I'd like to um, center. Oh, I better move this chat. I think it's on the screen. There we go. Um, that's what I'd like to center our dialogue around today. And what I'm sharing is meant to be um, an inspiration for further conversation. I think that um, one of the important things that I've learned about Ergo over the many years of working in and around Ontario education is that Ergo has played a key role in developing approaches to um, supporting language learners in our system and synthesizing and articulating teachers' perceptions. And so I, I'm, I'm really honored to be here today and to be part of this conversation. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement from my university. We recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. We acknowledge the university's presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto has been taken care of by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We wish to acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This treaty, sorry, this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. And I'd also just like to take a moment to reflect on what it means to acknowledge the history and legacy of colonialism, particularly as it relates to this dialogue and the work that we are doing in our communities. Relative to this topic of assessment, how do we understand the colonial legacy of assessment? What are the ways that language assessments and high stakes standardized language tests have functioned as gatekeepers, limiting access and even outright discriminating in matters of citizenship, education, employment and belonging. And at the same time, what are some of the privileges that colonialism has brought to assessment practice? Finally, what are our responsibilities as educators, policymakers and researchers to reconcile and develop relationships with people whose territory we are living on challenging linguistic hierarchies and legitimizing minoritized and alternative ways of speaking, knowing and being. So um, the image that is on this screen um, was part of um, a website that we designed around multilingual assessment that I'm going to share with you a little bit later. Um, and so we featured this image by the, the artist Sky Hopinka, who's from the Ho-Chunk Pechanga Nation whose work was part of an exhibition at the Art Gallery of, of York University. And his work explores designs of language as containers of culture and the play between the known and the unknowable. Hopinka himself studied and taught Chinook Wawa, a language rooted in the lower Columbia River Basin and prevalent in Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, and Alaska. Using both language and video, he's interested in notions of fluency, proficiency, experimentation, and interestingly, the moments when things fall apart. So I thought that could um, help to push our thinking a little bit in this, in this conversation. I'm just gonna watch the time here too. So um, I've prepared this presentation in three, four parts. I'm, I'm really only going to focus on the first three 
so far today. Um, and again, I, I decided to frame these as questions because these are questions that I have and that I think I'm hearing from educators working in the field that they have as well. So what theory of language underpins our current approach to language assessment in Ontario? What is the languaging of our bi bilingual and multilingual students in Ontario schools? What comprises a multilingual theory of language? And then when we bring all of these inquiries or wonderings together, how can we address multilingualism in assessment practice? So I'm going to, um, in, to answer each of these three pieces. In the first part, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the um, history of STEP and some things we, we know and have learned along the way in terms of using STEP. In the second part, I'm going to draw on some empirical work um, that I've been doing in one school district um, with students from uh, students who are enrolled in ELD and ESL programming. And in the third section, I'm going to draw a little bit on some contemporary theories in applied linguistics or critical applied linguistics that might um, help to shift our understanding. And I, I bring the, these theories to bear on the second point, which is if we document what students are doing in Ontario schools, what then is a theory that is useful to us in describing what we see? And so my presentation today is really grounded in um, my experience in schools and working with incredible educators over the last um, four years in particular, but, but many years before that. And then lastly, I'll, I'll introduce a project that we're working on next uh, in, in my work that, that Sharon kindly mentioned about addressing multilingualism in assessment practice. So. Um, we, I just wanted to point out what we know about Ontario education. And what always strikes me here is that 25% um, of students in our system are identified as newcomer or Canadian born English learners. That is a significant proportion. It is not a small amount. And this does not extend to recognize students who identify as bilingual or multilingual and not language learners. And so let's take a little peek into how the our system does um, define language learners. And I think you're all familiar with what I'm about to share, but I, I'm hoping to provide an opportunity to think a little bit differently about it. So um, in Ontario curriculum, we identify students as, some students as English language learners. And these are students in, our schools who first, whose first language is another language or a variety of English or French that is significantly different from the language used for instruction who may require educational supports to assist them in attaining proficiency in English. But when we look at this document right away, um, we, we might start to feel troubled or wonder about what this means because um, one of the key groups that is identified is Aboriginal students, and that's how it's written, um, whose first language is other than English or French. And I, I bring this up because further to um, the discussion earlier about what is the, the legacy of colonialism in Canada, especially vis-a-vis -vis assessment, I think this really matters that um, the STEP framework and the 2007 ESL policy, I don't think, I don't know, but I wonder, this is a wondering that I have, um, to what extent were uh, Indigenous communities or scholars or knowledge keepers consulted on um, whether and why um, students who are part of Indigenous communities should be part of this document? Um, I think this might reflect where Ontario th thinking was at, in, back in 2007 and before, but um, certainly it doesn't reflect where we are at today. And so um, further to some other things that I'll talk about, this is what I mean by advocating for change and perhaps updating our ESL policy and our approaches to assessment. Each of the other categories as well might um, benefit from revision and redefinition because broadly we can say that students 
are sometimes categorized as language learners, even when their linguistic practices are the same as other students in the classroom. And this, we, we some researchers have called this an assessment of inferiority um, that um, has been, attention has been brought to her, especially from a racial linguistics per perspective. Um, scholars like Flores and Rosa or Ophelia Garcia, I, I believe you saw um, a video in preparation for today, um, have talked about this. Now, where are we today? I think very much Ontario education has begun to recognize that the exclusion of students' home languages from the educational context is limiting and does not reflect how bilingual or multilingual individuals and communities use language in everyday life. I think we have that understanding broadly. Um, however, students' multilingualism and their multilingual competence is not specifically addressed in curriculum policy and assessment guidelines. Um, generally, as we know, uh, students are immersed in English or French instruction and use of other languages in the classroom depends on teachers' pedagogy. I've been in many classrooms and seen teachers' incredible pedagogies that engage with multilingualism and multilingual practice. But um, do these pedagogies connect to assessment? And um, we can think about that. That's something we can wonder about. So with regard to staff, the ministry has engaged in at least 14 years of work to bring language assessment to the core of classroom practice and ESL programming. And this work has achieved breadth and scale, as we know, resulting in significant change at the system, district, and school level. And foremost among these aims has been this almost system-wide implementation, although we know that it's uneven. This effort responded to the Ontario Auditor General's report back in 2005, which found that the system was not meeting the needs of students or aims of ESL programming in Ontario education. And subsequently, researchers also found differences among students' opportunities for and access to education, including a high degree of push out uh, from secondary school, lengthy high school credit accumulation rates, and reduced or lack of inclusion in um, standardized math and literacy assessments. And these findings, I would suggest, are upheld by the recent uh, report that I read um, from Code uh, and Jenny Donahue that documents ongoing issues and challenges relating to the 2007 ESL policy and language assessment in particular. And some of the features or some of, some of what was pointed out are that um, initial assessment is being conducted by educators without ESL or ELD qualifications. Students are being sometimes placed in lower grades, even though they are capable of achieving at a higher grade. Placements are limiting opportunities to learn in mainstream classes. There are challenges in understanding how to appropriately adapt expectations and make modifications to learning and assessment tasks. There's a need for greater clarity around what comprises the level of proficiency in English required for success, and all of this leading to inequitable learning opportunities. So let's, let's dig into STEP for a moment. Um, STEP was developed by experienced teachers, expert teachers, and based on um, their interpretation of students' linguistic performances. And it's also, you, these um, descriptors are used to provide evidence of progress of students' language acquisition. And so the use of STEP really creates a defining role for teachers, as we know, particularly ESL and ELD teachers. And this provides a context for understanding the nature of the empirical research base for STEP. So like the common European framework of reference for languages, STEP descriptors were empirically validated in terms of teacher perceptions of how to usefully describe students' language use. Teachers rated descriptors of students' language proficiency and these were sorted into scales. And so what was sorted was teacher perceptions of learning rather than perhaps descriptors of student learning itself, which were then developed into evaluation criteria. So teachers' ideas about language and theories about language acquisition are therefore reflected in the operation, operationalization of language pro progression inherent in STEP, articulating teacher perceptions of the linguistic demands of Ontario curriculum and the kinds of linguistic performances that are observable in the learning context. So it's interesting when we use that word observable, it's like, well, what are we making visible? 
um, to be observed. And so the, the import of these teacher perceptions, of course, reflected the discourses and knowledge about language teaching and learning that were really um, commonly shared at the time of STEPS development. And descriptors were further influenced by teacher ideas about how to organize um, the continua for comparison by grade and modality. Um, so divided into skills, as we know, the language, language skills, and also assumptions about use and uh, inferences that can be drawn from the continua, including whether students need to complete all of one level before moving on, what point is enough to demonstrate progression, and whether different levels are distinguishable, and whether language is separate from literacy and curriculum learning, for instance. So whereas STEP is meant to support multilingual students, it may not fully represent the sociolinguistic realities of Ontario classrooms and communities, as well as the body of research that promotes students' multilingualism in instruction, including uh, a great body of work in empirical studies and position papers from Canadian researchers. So um, we can say that connecting descriptors to language use in the classroom contributes to an appropriate and representative form of observation of students' linguistic performance and their process of language acquisition. However, students' multilingual practice can also be rendered invisible or viewed as deficit or interference, depending on how the descriptors articulate and address multilingualism. And so to ensure fairness, we really need to make sure that students have a fair and equitable opportunity for assessment and to show what they know. Um, what else might I wanna say about this? So when we use these kinds of language assessments and language standardized um, assessments and tests and, and frameworks, we tend to institutionalize monolingualism and perpetuate perspectives on language as separate and bounded entities. However, we do know when we walk through Ontario classrooms that even when pressed to operate in monolingual mode, using English or French only, students' use of the full range of their linguistic repertoire persists. And this is part of our classrooms and communities. So what does this mean in terms of language assessment? So I, I think many of you are very familiar with the individual descriptors. I just wanna point out a, a few things about steps one and two across many of the continua. We, it, it is evident when we take a close look at these that the step descriptors focus, of course, on English language development, but the use of home languages is understood as a form of language contact, um, viewing translanguaging or, or use of the home language or code switching or code mixing as an interference or deficit. So it's actually something that we use to identify that students are at steps one and two, and it's absent from, from the rest of the continua. And we might call this a monolingual bias, which uh, can idealize native speaker-like norms, reify language standards and hierarchies, and view bilinguals as um, French sociolinguistic growth gene said, two monolinguals in one person. And seen through this lens, students who may be less comfortable or proficient in English may be positioned as deficient or having incomplete target language competence, rather than as possessing an enhanced linguistic repertoire that combines complementary knowledge of multiple languages. And so the significance of this understanding of language, this theory of language that is within our assessment resource, has consequences for teaching and learning. And we can call this pedagogical washback that goes beyond language assessment because STEP sends a powerful message to teachers about the inclusion or exclusion of students' multilingual competence as a functional resource in the classroom. And so this, the potential of STEP is refracted by a concern over the relationship of how STEP defines language standards in education and the extent to which its monolingual orientation might foreclose possibilities for engaging with multilingualism in curriculum and assessment. And so given that the framework itself was developed based on teacher perceptions, then we can ask, what are these perceptions? What are our theories of language that we bring to the classroom? And so here's where I want to switch from 
talking about step, and I'm just gonna check the time for a second, to um, looking at some field work, some, some evidence from field work that we've been conducting in a local secondary school. And in, in sharing this, I'm interested in asking how, how can we generate theory from the ground up? How can we generate a theory of language from our classrooms and communities? What are we seeing? What are we documenting, observing and understanding? Um, and who's involved in those processes as well? And so in this particular project, we aimed to counter English dominance and the linguistic hierarchies and global inequities manifest in this school and community to document and enhance teacher pedagogies from a decolonizing stance that counters the invisibility and erasure of migrant students' languages in the English medium educational context, and that upholds the importance of recognizing, naming, and mobilizing minoritized languages and identities in the face of ongoing coloniality, systemic racism, and marginalization. So immediately upon entering the the school and the classrooms where the research described here was situated, it was evident that students and uh, teachers actively engaged a multitude of semiotic resources, a fluid mixing across languages and modes of communication, making obvious the need for a way of thinking about language that recognizes these practices. And so let's, let's explore a little bit about uh, this sociolinguistic context and what we saw. So um, I, I selected some data to share with you, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. We saw so many wonderful um, aspects of students' language and literacy practices. And so one that is so important was this multitude of resources. And especially during the pandemic, uh, we see here a Jamboard, we see the use of Google Docs, we see the use of um, Google Maps and images, um, digital communication between students and teachers. So the language use and meaning making is not just print-based. It includes the digital, it includes images, um, it includes icons um, and all kinds of, of resources in the classroom. And, and I love the ways in which teachers and students exploited these resources. And we saw so many student self-directed learning strategies. And so um, I, I love this picture because it shows the effortful learning and persistence of this student who was completing, um, this, this picture on the right, was completing a graphic organizer looking at urban and rural communities. And this student, um, I think scaffolded by the practices of the classroom, selected for himself various things to help him fill out this graphic organizer. And look at, he's just not gonna be stopped in, in getting this done. He has a picture dictionary that one of his peers brought over to him to use and he found um, what he needed and, and the right pages. He was using an iPad to look up um, images and use Google Maps to um, see visions of the community that he was describing. And he had his phone out using Google Translate and also using um, uh, text-to-speech software to look different things up. And this is, this is part of how our students are learning. We can see here also on the left how the teacher has organized um, the teaching of different learning skills. And this other uh, image in the middle just shows student use of um, Google Translate as well. We also very much found um, in these classrooms, multilingualism being used as a scaffold and a resource for disciplinary learning. So not just for language learning, but here in a math class um, for learning about um, some calculations for, um, articulating for showing one's learning and, and um, understanding key concepts relating to math learning. And so these were teacher and student created, showing that um, creativity and flexibility in the classroom. And this is, I would say, quite prevalent in um, many of the classrooms that I have seen across subject areas. We also see um, some, some key points around critical thinking. Um, 
here we can see students thinking about respect and discrimination and helping others. So this is some evidence of students learning and again here written in, in English and students own languages. But by contrast, um, we have some teacher ideas that, that I, we, we want to dig deeper into where this teacher is articulating that, that students were not able to say why, they're not able to make these connections. They struggled with things beyond the what. And while this may have been a perception, I'm not sure, they might, have, um, they might not have actually fully captured what students are capable of doing. And I love this picture because here, um, this student was um, tasked with drawing a map of his ideal community. And I noted when I was talking to him about his work that he drew six different bus stops on his map. And when we talked about it, he shared how important uh, mobility is within his community and how it was hard for him to participate in school and community activities because of a lack of access to um, transportation, living far away from um, bus stops and so on. And he, he had some very thoughtful ideas about putting, for example, a mosque and a church together, um, recognizing his um, perceptions of the interculturality of his community and so on. And so I would argue that this, this was evidence of, of the critical thinking in the classroom. We also saw a lot of higher order thinking. Um, so this advanced literacy work such as um, scaffolded, writing an I am from poem, using prompts, but this was a really wonderful example, and there were many examples of students writing poetry about themselves and their families, and I love this one um, where we really got to get a sense of um, how students thought about themselves and their resources. I'm from learning new things, like a child when he goes to school for the first time. I'm from savage, like a hungry lion who wants to eat the world. And wow, that really says a lot about um, this student's motivation and persistence and determination. And yet sometimes when we talk to teachers, we heard um, that they may always incorporate things like ways for students to take something that's happening in the world, in the world and to figure out what we can do to make a difference. That is something I do. It's a part of all of my programming, except in my ELD classes. And so again, what are we um, seeing and what are we observing? And then finally, I just wanted to draw our attention to the um, role of peer interactions and relationships and peer-to-peer -peer learning. This is an image of um, students from one ELD class coming to teach another class how to use um, Google Classroom and the different features. And how, what, when we talked to teachers about this, we really heard about how empowering it seemed to be for students to take on this role. And so if this is the kind of language that we're seeing, where is this language and this languaging reflected in our step descriptors? And therefore, what um, theory of language or what analytic lens can help us to make sense of this? kind of languaging and um, to address it in a purposeful and helpful and equitable way. And so here's where I wanna go back to theory for a moment and talk a little bit about what comprises a multilingual theory of language. So scholars working in bilingual and minority language teaching and learning contexts have put forward multilingual theories of language and there are different uh, theoretical lenses and concepts that we can use. And these emphasize the ongoing process of thinking and meaning making that takes place beyond the artificial boundaries of named languages. Noting that, um, and here I'm quoting Li Wei, a scholar from um, the UK, he says, multilinguals do not think unilingually in a politically named linguistic entity, even when they are in monolingual mode and producing one nameable language for a specific stretch of speech or text. Um, bilingual language users engage multiple and different voices to represent their distinct points of view of the world, shaped by their own experiences, values, meanings, intentions, and ways of speaking. And so if we want to shift or think about or, or wonder about shifting from a monolingual to a multilingual perspective, what might that entail? 
Um, some scholars have used these terms, monoglossic and heteroglossic understandings of language. Thinking about um, monoglossic ideologies, referring to perspectives that keep language as separate and bounded. Um, and that looks at bilingualism through these dual monolingual standards versus a heteroglossic conceptualization uh, takes a more dynamic, permeable and composite view of bilingualism. We can also distinguish between, um, and bear with me here, um, monoglossic multilingualism, which might recognize multilingualism, but still see multiple and separate languages in the mind, or a heteroglossic multilingualism, which denotes a single linguistic system that is functionally rendered in different socially constructed languages. Jim Cummins has also recently um, referred to uh, this, this distinction of a monoglossic and heteroglossic multilingualism as um, a cross-linguistic uh, theory of translanguaging or uh, a unitary theory of translanguaging. And there's different implications for these two conceptualizations. But I think as educators working around language assessment, it's important for us to develop and, and recognize our own theory of language that underpins our assessment practice. So I've used a couple of key terms. I'm just gonna to explain two um, really popular ones in case you are, are unfamiliar with them. So translanguaging is a theory of language um, that has come from work with bilingual classrooms and communities. Um, most recently in the United States, there's been a lot of work uh, in the Spanish English bilingual populations and, um, but other contexts as well um, in, in the United Kingdom and in other places in Europe and beyond. Um, so this translanguaging theory of language is using one's idiolect, that means your own um, language, one's linguistic repertoire without regard for socially and politically defined named languages, looking at language as a multilingual, multi-semiotic and multimodal resource. So, um, looking at images, sound, affect, digital tools and technologies, our phones as part of that distributed cognition and meaning making tools that we use. And there's also this idea of pedagogical translanguaging or translanguaging pedagogies, which we're, some scholars are starting to write about and, and develop, which is very interesting. And this is, these are pedagogies wherein teachers and students strategically mobilize translanguaging practices for teaching and learning. And I would argue that some of the examples of strategies that I showed you earlier would fall under this um, category of teachers doing pedagogical translanguaging, whether they would name it that way or not. Um, that is something that um, when we apply theory to, to that practice, we could, we could describe it that way. Um, there's also, I, the theories of plurilingual and pluricultural competence, these have been very much popularized because they are, um, they underpin the Council of Europe's language policies. And these perspectives have been um, developed from French sociolinguists originally, but we are seeing a great uh, uptake of these theoretical um, perspectives in Canada, I think particularly because of our uh, background as a, a country with both English and French as official languages. And so this, when we talk about plurilingual and pluricultural competence, this is about recognizing competencies and connections across different languages that are, again, integrated, variable, flexible, and dynamic, and that these linguistic repertoires reflect individual experiences and trajectories with language learning and language use. And viewing competence then, as not merely a system of knowledge or capabilities or resources, which might step might do because it's you know systematizing what what students are knowing, which is a rather static view of these um, ideas about language, but rather as situated enactments of these elements of of language and linguistic competence. Um, both, um, I think it's important. Teachers sometimes ask me, well, what's the difference between plurilingualism and, and translanguaging? Both can be thought of as, I would say, a linguistic theory. So a theory of what language is. They can be thought of as a descriptive lens 
a way of interpreting what we see when uh, bilinguals are, are using their full linguistic repertoire in their communication. And it can also be a pedagogic practice. So both, both theories come from different places, but they, they can be used in these different ways. Um, recently, in, in these are just books by Canadian researchers that are starting to be published and that articulate some of these translanguaging and plurilingual pedagogies that begin with bilingualism and multilingualism as the norm in language teaching. Um, and looking at language teaching as not just teaching English, so to speak, but as expanding rep students' repertoires of practice. So um, what is really good to see is that while the theories have been developed um, some time ago, now we're seeing a lot more of um, resources and, and um, empirical work and strategies that educators can bring with them into the classroom. These, this is just a small assortment, but there's um, much more. And I would say Canadian researchers um, from many different parts of the country have been contributing to articulating what comprises a way of teaching that incorporates multilingualism. So we've got that, like we're, we may not have that done perfectly and we may not have it done to scale, but I would say certainly in Canada, we are moving towards multilingual education practices. But what about assessment? It's like this thing that is um, maybe not always connected. And so here, and I'm so sorry, this picture <laughs> didn't center and I played with it for far too long, but um, this is the website for um, a recent symposium we had on multilingual assessment. If you click, if, if you Google or click the link multilingualassessment.ca, you can access um, the some of the resources that were shared at this symposium. And so what this symposium did is it brought together researchers from around the world who are, and, and I should say, sorry, um, the symposium was co-organized by myself, Sunny Lau from Bishop's University and Angel Lin from Simon Fraser University. Um, and it brought together researchers from around the world who are exploring multilingual assessment. And the reason we wanted to bring them together is to start a conversation in the Canadian context of what about multilingual assessment here or multilingualism in assessment. And we can see, I, I've put both terms here because uh, we actually need to think about them a little bit differently. Multilingual assessment or multilingualism in assessment, what are these? And I would say the field is, is just beginning to explore um, these constructs, these ideas, these practices, but um, an outcome of this symposium was a group of the contributors have come together and are articulating a position paper about the key principles of uh, multilingualism in assessment. And I've, I've put some of them here um, and so far, the, the group is called the Multilingualism in Assessment Group. So, so here's where we're thinking now that um, multilingual assessments offer a way to assess what students know and what they can do when their full linguistic repertoire is employed as opposed to documentation based solely on monolingual assessment. And so this positions multilingualism as the norm and emphasizes complex dynamic language practices of multilinguals. It enables students to use the full range of their bilingual and multimodal resources and leverage or even exploit these resources for test taking and assessment tasks. Um, it recognizes all knowledge of any language or language variety can be a resource and a strength for education. And it shifts from a testing to an assessment for learning paradigm which I think actually in Ontario education, we do that really well, um, assessment for learning. There's a, there's a lot of shared understanding of this across um, contexts and panels and curriculum subject areas. Wherein um, language learning is seen as dynamic and obviously supported by feedback. And that's also part of the role of STEP. It is a, an initial assessment, but it's also an ongoing informative assessment. So this is again, something that is already part of our system. Um, Multilingual assessment also understands that learners are a heterogeneous group and what works for one student may not work for others. We can also see 
as we all know, in different schools or different classes, different patterns and, and different uh, uh, linguistic practices, depending on the students that are in the class. And it also um, upholds social justice and equity aims. So if these are some of the principles, do we have some evidence that this works? Well, this is the part that's um, starting to be explored. So what is the empirical support for multilingual assessment? What do some researchers in other contexts already know? Or what are they discovering? Um, we are seeing increasing indications of the positive effects and impacts of multilingual assessment and the potential for positive washback. So the potential to positively influence teaching and learning. So first that um, multilingual assessments contribute to better performance and more accurately reflect student knowledge, which of course allows teachers to make more appropriate inferences about students' teaching and learning needs. We also are learning from empirical work that multilingual assessments are many and varied. They can include bilingual or multilingual tests or assessment tasks. They can include different resources used during assessment and also strategies for assessment. Um, that consider the full range of students' competencies. So sometimes teachers ask me, well, what is multilingual assessment? Well, it's different depending on the context. And what is it in Ontario education? I would say we, that is something we really um, don't know yet. We need to explore it and develop it. Um, we also know that uh, TESOL pre-service education and in-service professional learning can develop professional competence in language assessment literacy for engaging with multilingualism in assessment. So is there space for this in Ontario curriculum? And I want to say that I am excited by, um, for instance, the, the new Ontario math curriculum, which if you access it and, and the link is here, the section on planning mathematics programs for English language learners, articulates a space for translingual practice. It is named in our curriculum documents, um, I, I believe both for the um, grade nine and also for the um, one to eight document. Um, it recognizes that this practice is creative and strategic. So students can be creative and strategic in their translingual practice and use the full range of their linguistic repertoire to select features and modes from that repertoire that are most appropriate to communicate for a variety of purposes. And I would suggest that this would include assessment purposes. So given that we have some space for this, at least in our math curriculum, um, where can we grow? And how might we look to bring similar language into our ESL policy? Is that possible? Is that desirable? And um, what, what might that say or what, what what should we say? Um, so just some concluding thoughts and next steps. Um, broadly in this advocacy agenda that I'm suggesting here, the idea is to open students' expected performances of bilingualism or multilingualism, rather than to create a difference between students' bilingualism in school and what we see in our communities. Why is that different? Why when I take the bus or walk through school hallways or talk to bilingual or multilingual, um, oh, sorry, not talk to, but uh, engage with bilingual and multilingual uh, practices and communities and, and friends and myself, you know, when we can switch between different languages and we do that even as proficient English speakers, why, why is that not reflected in our assessment documents? How can we um, not send this message that there is a difference between the bilingualism you use in everyday life and the bilingualism that we in bring into school context? And especially for um, Indigenous communities, I think it's really important to also be turning to our Canadian scholars who are documenting and exploring Indigenous language revitalization and who have grounded understandings of what multilingualism and bilingualism means in their communities 
and how does this need to be reflected in our curriculum documents? So in developing uh, an approach or an understanding of multilingualism in assessment, I would say right now we're really at the stage of just thinking about what are the theories of language that we bring with us into language assessment. Because as teachers using STEP, we have so much um, room for engaging in equitable assessment practices. And so what is the theory of language we are bringing to the use of that document? How, what is the theory of language that is underpinning the way that we design the assessment tasks that create opportunities to observe linguistic behaviors that we then rate on this rather monolingual scale. Um, so I, I would suggest from what we know from other researchers is that a single approach, a universal approach for every classroom, for every global context, for every Ontario school may be impossible. Um, instead, we might need to look towards more holistic, situated, and local or context-specific approaches, classroom-specific approaches. And so um, in one of the projects that I'm working on um, with educators in one local school district, we are exploring some of these possibilities and seeking to generate some empirical support. And here are the questions we're asking. What are the specific challenges and opportunities for assessing bilingual and multilingual students in Ontario education? How are these challenges and opportunities negotiated by teachers? Whether and how can teachers incorporate multilingual resources in language and curriculum assessment tasks? And how does the use of these resources affect students' performance on these tasks? And so um, what this research is going to look like, um, we've so far been just mapping the assessment ecosystem and we're about to begin, postponed due to COVID obviously, um, field work to, to engage with teachers as co-researchers to develop an experiment with some multilingual approaches to assessment and then hopefully at the end to synthesize some approaches that seem to work in these contexts situated in Ontario education. And uh, I think I'll stop there. Here's um, some of the graduate students who have been working on this project, Marie Deleuze, Noah Kahn, Zoe Cortis, Rima Lesia, and Nikisha McGregor. McGregor. Uh, Noah and Zoe are not in this picture. Oh, and, and um, uh, yes, obviously that was from before time, the before times and when we could gather in person. Um, but I'm gonna stop there, which I think is our, our 40 minutes. And um, hopefully, this has given you some ideas about things we might discuss or things you might bring to your own practice and work with educators in, in your uh, schools and systems, districts. Um, Dr. Saskia, um, on behalf of Ergo and all of our Ergo members, I would like to, or we would like to graciously thank you for uh, being here with us today. You have shared your expertise on and inspired us to really think about our uh, step assessments and um, how it's, um, there's um, some colonialism uh, that can be seen throughout our step assessment and how it uh, puts English language uh, and other languages on a hierarchy and um, on a hierarchical scale. And, um, you know, just talking about translanguaging, translanguaging um, in our assessments and our strategies, I think, uh, especially as we are trying to be more culturally responsive in our, um, in our, uh, our towards our students, um, it's putting their language as an asset. And I think that's really important and something for us to share with our teachers is we can use their language as an asset. Um, and you've demonstrated that today uh, through your presentation. So thank you so much. And hopefully we can have you back again. Wonderful, it's, it's been a pleasure. And I just wanna to emphasize too that one of the things that is important about the development of STEP is that it has always been iterative. It, it hasn't been seen as a static document 
Um, over the years, it has been revised, it has been expanded to include different resources. And I think this demonstrates an openness to growth. And, you know, when we know more, we do things, we add more. When we know something differently, we follow through on that and, and we make the change. And so let's just keep that in mind about STEP is that when you know better, you do better. And we, you know, where the field of applied linguistics has come, where education has come and where Ontario educators have come, we are seeing this multilingual practice. So are we going to iterate again? Is there a is it a time for us to be, um, have fidelity to those, those ideas about STEP, which was that it is a developmental continua, that it, it's, it's going to be an unfinished document. And so if, it's, if we see it that way, there's room for um, bringing multilingual, multilingualism into our assessment practice in a way that is supported by policy and supported by the tools and the resources that we are distributing system-wide. Any other questions or um, ideas from members about the learning this morning? Um, I was just going to share, I appreciated the point about um, use of L1 or primary home languages being noted in steps one and two, but but not further on. and. Uh, a summer work project that we engaged in in our board was creating a, a step specific resource because we're heavy, we have a better tool for sharing step data. And so suggesting scaffolds um, at each step. And as we were designing the resource, we said the need for using other languages for comprehension and for demonstration of understanding increases <laughs> as the steps get greater and the demands in the classroom get greater. And so that in all our resources and our strategies recommended, we kept coming back to use L1 and you know, empower students to use other languages, to translate, to draw, to... Um, so I, would, I just appreciated you acknowledging that in step because I hadn't really looked back the other way and thought, yeah, that, that needs to shift. We, we kind of had internalized um, the, the ongoing need or the ongoing benefit of translanguaging, but it isn't evident <laughs> in the actual steps themselves. Yeah, so it's an excellent uh, point to consider. And I, I really appreciate that you use the word need there too, because I think another thing that we can acknowledge as you know, bilingual, multilingual language users ourselves is we, we don't always use another language because we need to. Like, can we get rid of that idea? Sometimes we use it to be funny, Sometimes we use it to connect with somebody from our own um, linguistic or cultural background. Sometimes we just desire to use it because it's part of our, our identity. Um, it doesn't always have to be a need. And why do we have to send that message in schools that you, okay, you can use your home language if it helps you. It shouldn't just be if it helps you. It should also be if you want to. If you are creative and can use multiple languages, images, modes, digital technology to show your thinking, to show your meaning making and your conceptual knowledge, let's do that. We know that we do that in our assessment practice in general, but again, the multilingualism piece is absent from that. We're already talking about um, that triangulation of uh, conversations, products, processes, right? And, and other ways of show, showing what you know. So let's just put multilingualism in there not just because we need to, but maybe because we want to. We had, uh, Atala has her hand up as well. Go ahead, Atala. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Saskia. Um, I've, I've seen you before and many presentations and it, you always want me with your knowledge and your expertise. Nice to see and, you again. <laughs> and, um, I, I think the question was already posed to on the chat by Rose. Um, I, I feel that in a sense, and this is probably a, a, not, not a politically correct, but you're kind of preaching to the choir in regards to um, 
you know, like asset based lens constantly, you know, trying to make sure that our students are seen and heard and valued all across the curriculum, especially in boards like like mine, where um, smaller boards, you know, we need to be become more creative in order for our students to make sure that they do have those equal opportunities. So my point is that, um, is there a conversation, which I think, like I said, Rose posed a question, to revise the policy? Um, I, I know that, um, like you mentioned, STEP, I, I believe there is a lot of wiggle room in regards to interpretation and how we can use that particular document. But I feel as teachers and as leads in this particular work, we need policy in order to back up <clears throat> sometimes our our suggestions, recommendations are seen as um, kind of lightly per se, if there is no policy to back up what, what we are going to say. So now the math uh, curriculum that you highlighted is really helping us, at least in my in, in my experience, is really helping to really leverage this work. But I feel that the policy definitely needs to be updated in regards to what are some of the things that are expected, that are mandated, that are kind of, you know, in order for us to really push the work forward. And one of the things too, you did mention the um, Indigenous students, but also uh, some countries that are stated within the policy that are considered that we should consider those students as language learners, which has been a lot of conversation, I'm sure, across the board in regards to equity, inclusion, and so on and so forth. So just wondering, just going back to my point, are, are you working or planning to work with, with ministry in regards to, to really revising the policy? Because I think that will be our first step. Um, that, I, I agree with you. It's been 14 years since that policy was, was written. And um, like the recent code report points out is that um, there are inconsistencies around implementation and, and spaces where we need to revisit. So it is, it is time. It, these things do take time. Um, and I think myself and, and other researchers um, here in Ontario, we have always been open to collaborating with the ministry and the ministry has been very um, open to including us in these conversations. And I, I just want to emphasize that the leadership around ESL in Ontario education it's not come from some abstract place, some abstract uh, group of, of people. It, it's come from people like yourselves who are the ESL instructional leads in the province who have been seconded to the ministry and have brought this agenda forward and who bring what they know from their classroom contexts, from their school contexts, from their district contexts. And, um, that that's really important. Like we have been the ones that are doing this work. So let's just keep going. Um, and I know there are, there are cycles of review for curriculum. I'm hoping that it's time for ESL soon. And given that, you know, the math curriculum was the, the most recent one to be updated. I think we could say that it's, you know, likely when other curriculum subject areas get revised, I'm hoping that this kind of language makes it into those policies. But th those are just the curriculum documents. There's other ways of enacting and creating curriculum policy and teachers create policy every day in their classroom with their students. Families create their own family language policy in their homes. Principals create language policy or in, in schools and, and ESL teachers do too. So um, I think, I know I've heard about resistance and well, I've heard a really interesting thing that some districts are moving from using the term ELL to multilingual language learners or, and I remember hearing that, um, I think in Sharon's district, um, many, many years ago, one of, one of the uh, schools had created its own school-based language policy. And that was what their policy stated. And um, so we don't have to wait for the documents, I think. Now, I don't know if that's a popular opinion at the district level, um, but hopefully this presentation, I don't think it probably, maybe it told you a few new things, but I don't think so. I think you know all of these things already from being incredible instructional leads. Maybe this presentation just might make you feel 
well, my hope is that it gives you some, some more empirical evidence, some theories, a little bit of language to articulate what you already know and do. So when you go back to your board and you wanna advocate, you can draw on these kinds of ideas and, and bring that new math document and say, look, if we're doing it in math, I guess there's space to do it in other subject areas too. And if we're not doing it in math, well, hey, it's now in the policy document. So how are we gonna work towards that? I mean, we, we, we can, as ESL teachers, we, I think we always, um, grab on to whatever things we can. We're very pragmatic and strategic, right? When, so the door opens a little crack, we just like walk right in. And so I think let's, let's use these opportunities to open the door a little wider. Thank you, Saskia, and thank you for the questions um, and um, the great focus that we can continue working on in our, in our own areas across the province. and. We look forward to the continuing conversation and learning about this topic um, as we go this year. Um, and, and I'm sure if, if people want to connect or meet uh, informally outside of our GO meetings, I'm sure we can arrange a uh, space to do that too, um, after people have had time to, to ponder all of the learning and how it fits with what they're already doing in schools. I think. So we're just going to take a break um, and let everyone have a break from sitting and attending to a screen for so long. And we'll meet back in about five minutes. It's a short break um, and, and we'll continue from there.